Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Union Church of Los Angeles for our Sunday morning combined English language worship service. Thank you for joining us today. Those of you in the sanctuary and those of you on Zoom. If you are on Zoom at this time, please mute your devices. Thank you so much. And now we would like to play our prelude. Jin will be leading us in He Leadeth Me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Union Church this morning. Um, for our call to worship today, it comes from Psalm 34. I had it a second ago. Psalm 34, verse 8. Okay. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. And I'm sure this morning that many of us are waiting for many things, are waiting, waiting for many answers to prayer. And maybe you've been waiting for years or decades for the answers to your prayers. And the one thing that we do not have to wait for is for God to be with us, no matter what the answer is. And so today, let us, <clears throat> excuse me, um, tune our hearts towards him and taste and see that God is good no matter what. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us together here today. Thank you that you are good despite our circumstances. Thank you that you are good Despite whatever happens in the future, thank you that you are good, no matter what. And Lord, I pray that we, today we will taste and see your goodness. We give glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alicia. At this time, please stand if you are able and join in singing our first song. This is a country gospel style song, which you might want to dance and clap along with and Jin is going to switch from violin to fiddle for us to play just a closer walk with thee
walking. Please remain standing for all hail the power of Jesus' name. Please join me in the community prayer. You may be seated. Okay. I will read one, and you can join me for all. When we are scattered, Jesus, our good shepherd, gathers us in. When we are lost and lonely, we can depend on Christ's love. When we are oppressed, Jesus, our good shepherd cares for us when we are threatened because of who we are we can depend on christ's protection we know christ because christ's tenderness has guided us for generations christ knows us by name christ will lay down his very life for our sake let us worship our good shepherd who cares for all of us with fierce love let us give thanks for Christ's presence with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alicia. At this time, please stand for our opening hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
just filling time until people get in place to light the candles. <laughs> you may be seated. This is a very sweet thing we do. We light a light in the name of the maker who lit the world and breathed. We light a light in the name of the sun who saved the world and stretched out his hands to us. light in the name of the spirit who heals the world and fills our souls with yearning and all together we say we, we light three, three lights in the, in the name of the trinity of love god, of god above us, above us god, god beneath us god beneath us, god beneath us. The, beginning, the beginning the end and the everlasting one amen friends i want to invite you to stand if you're able to and join us in singing this anthem of hope this anthem of Love, amen, this anthem that Fannie Lou Hamer, the great civil rights activist, uh, made famous when she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, amen. That in, they're in that jail cell fighting for uh, equality and fighting for truth and justice. She sang this song in the, in the jail cells, and just like Paul and Barnabas who sang, amen, and their captors were compelled by the message, this was also the case for our dear sister Fanny Lou Hamer. So let's sing this together. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Time to pass the peace one to another. Please join me in reciting this, and then we are going to take our time and greet one another, chat, and then I'll come up and tell you when to sit back down. <laughs> Christ is, is our, our peace, peace, not, not an, an easy, easy peace, peace, not, not an, an insignificant peace, peace not, not a half-hearted peace, but, but may, may the peace of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ be with us now. The peace, peace of the Lord, Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you. I receive his peace. Please pass the peace one to another. <laughs> Let's all gather around and find our seats. Find a seat. Have a seat. All right, Pastor Ken is going to bring us our scripture reading today. Hi, Pastor Ken. Good morning. I'm going to get out of the way. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. 
and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So they will be, there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. The word of God for the people of God this morning comes from John chapter 10. I want to welcome each and every one of you to Union Church of Los Angeles this morning. And uh, this is the, the fourth Sunday of Easter, the fourth Sunday of the Eastertide tradition in which we are living in the marvel and in the wonder of resurrection. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 10. I want to say welcome to all of our visitors, those, those who are joining along on Zoom. It's so wonderful to see so many folks in the house of the Lord this morning. John chapter 10 is on page 872 in the Red Bibles in the pew in front of you. Today I kind of want to encourage you to keep the Bible uh, relatively close by because we're going to we're going to look at a lot of passages of Scripture today that have to do with shepherds. Amen. We're going to talk about shepherds and sheep. The fourth Sunday of Easter tide, the fourth Sunday in Easter, is always reserved as what's known as Good Shepherd Sunday. This is Good Shepherd Sunday. If you're a part of a Lutheran tradition, if you grew up in the Methodist Church, Presbyterian, the Catholic Church, this Sunday is the Sunday in which we pause and we acknowledge this really powerful metaphor. And I, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about uh, shepherds and sheep because I grew up in Southeast Los Angeles. Amen. There was not a lot of livestock training. There's not a lot of working with livestock. But this analogy of God and this analogy particularly of Jesus being a shepherd and the relationship between sheep and shepherd is very, very import, important in scripture. And what we're going to look at today is that analogy. We're going to look at that relationship and why that is such a powerful lens for us to understand our relationship to God. Amen. So John chapter 10 verses 11 through 18. We're going to look at this passage of scripture. Then we're going to go back way into the Old Testament and kind of see where this metaphor, where this analogy of Jesus as shepherd, Jesus as our, as, as our, we as the flock of God comes from. So John chapter 10 verse 11 says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his, his life for the sheep. The hired hand who, does, who is not the shepherd does not, does not own the sheep, sees the wolves coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. I'm going to pause there real quick. You know, if you can put up the graphic. This morning I want to show a very quick graphic. This is something, if you have gone to church all of your life, you've heard that there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you've been interested or if you've been invited to church at any time, or perhaps if you've invited somebody to church or told them about the faith, and someone expresses interest in, in, in reading more about Jesus, oftentimes the first Gospel that people are encouraged to explore is the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was very specifically written for a universal audience. In other words, it wasn't when John writes his Gospel, unlike Matthew, who was primarily writing to a Jewish, Jewish audience, and unlike Mark, who was writing towards an audience that was more Roman, he was writing to a Roman audience, Luke was writing towards the Gentiles. He was actually not writing towards the Jewish audience. Uh, religious body. He was not writing to the Roman Empire like Mark was. Luke was thinking about all the outcasts. He was thinking about all those people that were otherized in the, the, the first century ancient Near East. John, however, John is writing towards humanity. 
And so oftentimes when people talk about John and why it's important to study the Gospel of John is because John's not speaking from a cultural lens. He's speaking from a human experience. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have a very chronological uh, pattern. In other, in other words, it starts with Virgin Mary, the, the wise men. It starts with the genealogy, and it goes into the life of, of Jesus somewhat chronolog chronologically. The Gospel of John is not written in that pattern. The Gospel of John is written in the pattern of seven. Everybody say seven. Okay, so if you're going to study the Gospel of John, you have to understand that there are seven... The, the pattern of seven is how most people are encouraged to understand the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has seven miracles, it has seven teachings, and seven I am statements. Those I am statements are extremely important because in the Old Testament, when Moses, who is the deliverer, is called by God to set people free, his big question to God is, all right, who, who are you? What's your name? Who do I say sent me? And when God is asked, tell me your name, God doesn't give him a title. God doesn't give him a, a, a religious name. God says, I am. I am. And so when Jesus in the Gospel of John uses this phrase, I am, it is very, very uh, filled with theological meaning for the Jewish audience. Jesus, every time he says, I am, is putting himself in that divinity that Jesus rightfully is supposed to take. So in the Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements. Today we're looking at the I am statement of I am the good shepherd. And the I am statements are always preceded by a miracle and followed with the lesson. So John who was Jesus' best friend. John was literally Jesus' ride or die. The Bible calls him his best friend. John says that Jesus referred to him as the beloved disciple. Peter was a little bit of the hothead, amen? He was the rock. He was the one who, was, was given a, who, who represented authority, who had passion, who had zeal. I think about the, the, the great LAUSD educator from Garfield, Jaime Escalante, who said you have to have ganas, you have to have grit. John, uh, or Peter represented that. John was Jesus' ride or die. When Peter ran away, when all the disciples hid, Jesus stood by, by John stood by Jesus' side, and literally as Jesus is saying his last words, he's breathing his last breath, there's John and Jesus' mother Mary. And, Je and Jesus says to John, John, that's your mom now. The one of Jesus' last seven words is, John, your mom. And mom, here's, here's your new son. I'm going, but you're gonna I'm not leaving you by yourself either. So John has these famous sevens. So whenever we look at the statement of Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, we're going to look at the context because that's how Jesus' best friend, his homie, his buddy, his ride or die, his closest friend. Your closest friend know you in a way that nobody else knows you, right? You might say you have a lot of acquaintances. You know a lot of people that know you. But actually, your friends, your best friends, they know, they know how to read between the lines. Amen? <laughs> they can read your body language. They can hear it in your voice. Something doesn't sound right. You okay? You really good? This is a safe person you could talk to. This is me. John writes about Jesus in that language. And one of the ways in which John says Jesus describes himself is as a good shepherd. Somebody say good shepherd. Okay, so that was a little bit of a background. Now we're going to go way back into the Old Testament and understand that this analogy of shepherd came from one source primarily in Scripture. The source of, of the shepherding analogy and the shepherding metaphor did not originate with Jesus or with John. It originated with David. David is the first person to describe this, this relationship with God through the lens of a shepherd. And by the way, what was David's profession? He was a shepherd himself. So let's go to 1 Kings. We're going to go to 1 Kings in chapter 17. We're going to go way back in 1 Kings chapter 17. And that's on page 228. And I want, to, I want to look really quickly at the origin story of the shepherd 
analogy. This is the beginning. This is something for us to lodge in our spiritual mind. When we hear about Jesus as our shepherd, the one who introduces this is David. And listen to David's origin story himself. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, page 228, verse 32 says this. And again, the context of this is there's a giant in the land. The giant's name is Goliath. And Goliath is standing before the army of Israel and is taunting them, literally mocking the I am, mocking God and saying, I dare any one of y'all to cross that line. David was the runt of the litter. He had a bunch of brothers and he was the little buddy. He was a little guy. But he hears this Goliath. He hears this giant, this Philistine mocking God. And he says, let me at him. Let's read what, how, he, how, how he literally says it in verse 30, 32. David said to, ha said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Verse 33, Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But listen to what, this is where the, the analogy of shepherd comes in, verse 34. But, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep and hit for, for his father. And whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. Listen to what he's, what he's saying. I'm a shepherd. God's my shepherd. And as a shepherd, if there was a lion or a bear that came and took one of my sheep, I would go and chase it down. And then he goes on to say this. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant killed both lions and bears. This some circumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. David kind of goes a little uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino on us at the end there. He starts getting personal with it. Amen. But he literally says, I was a shepherd and God is my shepherd. And if I was bold enough to go and confront lions, I don't think he's speaking hyperbolically. I think he literally said I had to go chase down lions and bears and I would take it out of the lion's mouth. Anybody ever see two dogs go at it? It's, it's intimidating. It's a lot of noise. It's a lot of, David said I would go into the midst of it even if it was a lion or a bear and I would rescue the lamb from the mouth. And if it turned on me, <laughs> I would roll up my sleeves and say you really want to go for it. And I would strike it down. This is the, the same David that says to you and to me, who says about his God in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. God is your shepherd and you are his sheep. The Bible says that, Paul, that, that David goes on to describe that he makes us lie down in green pastures and leads us beside still water. He restores our soul. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, do not fear because God is with you. In fact, his rod and his staff, they comfort you. And he will prepare a table in front of your enemies. He'll pour oil on you and you'll be blessed all the days of your life. This is the origin story of what it means. Whenever Jesus refers to himself as shepherd, he's going back to David. He's going back to David's relationship with, with God and David's relationship with shepherding to properly understand what's happening in John chapter 10. So let's go back to John chapter 10. And again, we're going to continue reading. Because in this analogy in which Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, Jesus also contrasts that with evil shepherds or false shepherds. And this again is very much of an Old Testament lens. We're going to go into Ezekiel 34, which is literally a whole chapter dedicated to how to identify bad shepherds. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd Ezekiel 34 tells us what a bad shepherd looks like and what the result of following poor leadership or people who are self-interested. 
Jesus says in John chapter 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolves coming and leaves the sheep, sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away from, runs away because a hired hand does not care for his sheep. Ezekiel chapter 34, we're not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to put, your, uh, put that chapter in your, in, your, uh, in your study. There's a whole chapter, and it's, it's extraordinary. I'll read an excerpt fr from it because it's such a powerful, it's a powerful juxtaposition, a contrast for us to understand the voice of God and the voice of false shepherds. This is what is happening in Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 the people of Israel have gone after different idols and they find themselves in exile. They're in Babylon and, and God is lamenting the fact that they've kind of walked away. They walked astray. And he says this in Ezekiel chapter 34. That's on page 702, verse 1 and 2. It says this, mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord, ah, you shepherds of Israel, you have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with their wool, you slaughter the fatlings, you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick, you have not bound up the injured, you have not brought back the strayed, you have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness, you have ruled them. And it goes on to explain really what a, what a, what a, what a bad shepherd, what Jesus refers, to, what John refers to in, in chapter 10 as a hired hand, someone who's not a true shepherd. He's not going to go into harm's way <laughs> for those sheep. In fact, he says he's going to run the other way. When the wolves come, he's going to scatter. David said, man, if a lion and a bear came, I went after them and I brought back what was rightfully God's. In Ezekiel 34, not only does a, a hired hand or a bad shepherd not protect the sheep, the, this was what the scripture is describing is shepherds that exploit. He's saying in Ezekiel chapter 34, you're where you are because those who are supposed to be le leading by example are, you're eating the fat ones. You're eating the fatlings. You're, you're taking the wool. You're not feeding. You're not caring for. And now everyone is scattered. And God says in verse 13 of this passage, uh, verse 23 of chapter 34 in Ezekiel, he gives a prophetic statement. He says this in verse 23. I will set up for them a good shepherd, one shepherd. And he says, my servant David. Other translations said, Say, I'm going to send you a, a servant, and he's going to bring up all the sheep under one flock. And he's going to be in the spirit of my servant, David. When Jesus comes to the disciples, when John tells us one of the seven ways for you to understand my buddy, my prow, my friend, is you got to understand him as David understood God as shepherd. He'll fight for you. He'll chase after you. He will not exploit you. He will not use you. Amen? The way God wants to come after us is with the fierce love. And in fact, here in Ezekiel and in John chapter 10, Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples, not only am I coming for you, the lost sheep of Israel, I'm coming for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. If we continue reading in that passage of Scripture in John, he says, not only am I going to be the, the flock the shepherd of this flock, but I'm going to bring others in as well. Amen? I'm going to bring others who may not look like you, who may not eat the same foods, who may not come from the same background. The Bible says for this, for this read, uh, in verse 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep who do not belong to this fold. In other words, who do not come from where you come from. Amen? And I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. I want to close with this aspect about sheep, because again, I was 
doing this research on sheep, and I felt very out of place because as I was reading the commentaries, it was very clear who came from a farm, amen? They just knew how to talk about sheep, and they had all these dynamics, all these facts about sheep. Honestly, most of us don't see sheep as a compliment, right? In our common vernacular, in our culture, in fact, if you're referred to as a sheep, it's a term of, it's, it's a derogatory term. You're sheep, you're sheeple, whatever you want to call it. Jesus does not speak of sheep in a derogatory way. He speaks of sheep in a very nurturing and, co and, and, and dependent way. One of the things that I did find fascinating about sheep is that sheep are the animals that have one of the largest memory. In other words, they have done studies to show that sheep can memorize the voice of up to 50 different, uh, different uh, animals and people in their life. They're very, very quick to recognize the voice of someone. And I think about the importance of how Jesus says, the sheep know my voice and they hear me and they understand that it's me. When Jesus resurrects and he comes to Mary, the Bible says that Mary and the women that were there could not recognize him. There was something about the resurrected Jesus that was different, amen? In fact, what did the Bible say? The Bible says they thought he was the gardener, amen? <laughs> they couldn't recognize him. But it was when Jesus said the word Mary, she heard his voice and recognized that it was him. Most people don't see the term of sheep as being a term of endearment. I was thinking about all the sports teams that have a very wide variety of animals that they choose to, as their mascots. There's even a fighting slug. My daughter goes to UC Santa Cruz. There's, I've never heard about the fighting sheep, amen? <laughs> There's no such thing as the mighty sheep. The, the, no, no sports team wants to be associated with, they will even take a, a, a slug, amen, over a sheep. But Jesus uses this analogy not because being a sheep is about being simply blindly leading. It's about having this relationship with the shepherd that David establishes back in the Old Testament that he reiterates in Psalm chapter 23. And John says, if you want to know my homie, if you want to know who Jesus really is, he's a shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. He does not exploit you. I want to encourage you this morning. When you follow Christ, when you choose to put Jesus at the center of your life, when you choose to put God in the highest place of your heart, when you choose to do that, God's not going to use you and abuse you. Amen? God's not going to play the old switcheroo. The Bible says the good shepherd, you can trust him. You can hear his voice and you can obey because he leads us to life and life abundantly. In fact, read verse 10 in chapter John chapter 10. Jesus, Jesus brings this analogy of the good shepherd on the heels of describing perhaps the greatest threat to the sheep. Verse 10 says this, so another one of the famous verses in, in the gospel of John. Referring to Satan, he says this, the thief comes to kill, to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That you may have bios and have zoe abundantly. Amen. I've talked about this before. The Greek term that Jesus uses there, he uses two different terms. The first one, I have come that you have life, that you have bios, but have the, the second term uses life abundantly. He uses the second term called zoe. This word zoe is a very unique Greek term because zoe means that you have fullness of life. You have zest in your step. You have joy. You're living life from a place of thriving and not just surviving. Amen? This is what Jesus says before he tells him. In fact, I'm the good shepherd. I've come not to oppress and to limit you, not to have you blindly following. I come that you could hear my voice and follow me towards this abundant life. Amen. Friends, I want to pray for you this morning as we remember this good shepherd. Amen. God has come that we would have life and have life abundantly. There are so many threats to our peace. I love this passing of the peace moment, and I feel like so many of the folks who chair and lead service here 
uh, it's a, such a moment of, of, of community where we get together and we fellowship with one another. One of the interesting things about sheep as well is that sheep have no self-defense. They have no way to defend themselves. The greatest uh, strategy many people believe that, that sheep employ is they, sh they employ group. They stay within the community. That's the safest place for sheep. That's why some sheep will even follow others astray because they'd rather stay in the, in the group and stay in community than wander off and be scattered. Jesus promises us that he is the shepherd that leads us to abundant life. We can trust. We can trust in God's plan for our lives. Can we pray? Amen. God, we thank you for being this good shepherd, God. We thank you for leading us to these still waters. God, we remember the words of David who said that you are our good shepherd and we shall not lack. God, I pray for peace of God to surpass all comp that co surpasses all all comprehension to fill our hearts and our minds again today. God, we thank you for being our good shepherd. We thank you, God, for not just giving us life. You choose to give us life fully, life in abundance, life with joy, life with peace, life from a place of love. Lord, we thank you for showing this to us. And Lord, may we go out and shepherd those in our spheres, God, our family, our friends, our community. God, commission us to be those shepherds in the spaces where we occupy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ruben. Please take a moment during the interlude to silently reflect on Pastor Ruben's message on the Good Shepherd. Thou my vision, what a wonderful hymn. Thank you so much, uh, Dan and Jen. We want to invite you at this time, uh, if you're able to join us in this time of collecting our offering, our gifts. We are so blessed by the way folks in this congregation, we say it uh, almost every week, how blessed we are by the generosity in this community and the generosity that each and every one of you uh, extend towards this community gives us the opportunity to serve so, so many others. Uh, this morning, I, I don't see him in the building or in the sanctuary now, but one of our dear, a uh, longtime uh, parishioners and friends of Union Church, uh, Chaplain Alfred uh, Pena is uh, in the building somewhere. Oh, he's, I think he's out fellowshipping with our, um, with our Nichigo congregation. Uh, Alfred Pena has been coming to this congregation since high school, since his days in Garfield High School, has been serving in the Navy for the last 22 years as a chaplain and is uh, joining us today. I believe he ministered in the Nichigo service. So uh, if you get a chance to visit, and uh, some of you may remember him from way back when, uh, in the next coming weeks, or next month or so, we're gonna be having a wonderful outreach with the Veterans Affair uh, here in Union Church of Los Angeles. We'll be, we'll be uh, extending some love to the vets that are on Skid Row, as well as uh, working with USC School of Medicine and Dentistry. They're, gonna, uh, they're not gonna be pulling teeth in front of Union Church, I mean, but they're gonna be doing some wonderful assessments and referrals uh, for folks who may not have had opportunity to see uh, a, a medical professional in a long time. So all of these things are really able to happen because God has gifted us with such a generous congregation. At this time, I want to invite the uh, ushers to come forward. There's a few ways to give digitally or through the offering envelopes in the pews in front of you. Let us uh, receive our offering this morning.
I invite you to stand if you're able to this morning as we sing this beautiful anthem of gratitude to our God of abundance. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Good Shepherd, we thank you, God, that you walk through us, God, through valleys, God, you walk through us through mountaintops. God, we thank you that you promise us to not worry, God. You invite us to live from a place of assurance that you are watching over each and every affair in our lives. God, we present to you our gifts, knowing that you are watching over every aspect of our lives. So, God, we give with gratitude, and we ask that you continue to flow, God, your goodness and your gifts into our lives, that they will flow through our lives. And we ask this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated at this time, and I want to invite our chairperson to come up and give us some announcements. Let us know what's going on in the life of the church. Hello again. Hello. We start, as always, with Saturday morning prayer. You can join in your jammies. It's at 8 a.m., correct? Yes, it is. 8 a.m., half an hour. It's on Zoom. Another thing that's on Zoom is our 9 a.m. Bible study with Pastor Ken. Yep, I got that right. It's very engaging. I've loved joining in the past. Um, Urban Farm. Anna, is there anything that I need to know? Tutorials on urban farm management. Please see Anna. Thank you for listening, you all on Zoom. Um, Thursday night ministry on Skid Row, um, serving our neighbors out here and providing them with a nice hot meal um, and donated clothes. That's Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Please uh, come and <laughs> it's a good time. Um, Tokyo Parkinson's, Little Tokyo Parkinson's group is this Saturday, the 27th from 10 a.m. to noon. And Vessi has an announcement about, there you are, has an announcement about our next movie night. Good morning, everybody. Real quick, um, thank you for those that came not yesterday, but it was Sunday, I mean the Saturday before we watched a silent movie. It was raining, not that many people came because LA was raining, so when it rains we know what happens. But um, next movie night, May 11th, we are watching a Japanese film. It's called Every Day a Good Day. Um, Hisayo recommended it to me, so I would manage to find a version with English subtitles, which was not easy. And it's a, a coming of age story of a young girl who learns, who's kind of lost in life and she um, learns how to do the tea ceremony. So it's a lot of beautiful shots of how the tea ceremony works and, and it's her growing and coming into her own through you know, learning the tradition and the tea ceremony. It's, it's a lovely, it's a beautiful, very poetic, again, slow movie, but very poetic. May 11, 4 p.m. social hall, come join us. Yay, and with that, I'll bring uh, Pastor Ruben up for the benediction. Hey, Amen. I want to invite you to stand as we go forth from this place. We go forth in singing and in joy. And uh, on, this, on this Earth Day weekend, we want to go forth from this place. And uh, the opportunity to, to serve at the Urban Garden is our little reminder that we are a part of this wonderful uh, world that God has given us to steward. So as we go forth from this place, let us go forth with this benediction. God, we thank you for shepherding us and leading us and guiding us. God, we pray that you would 
be our strength and our rock, God. And as we go from this place, God, may the silence and the majesty of the hills, may the joy of the wind, may the peace of the fields, may the music of the birds, God, may the fire of sun, God, may the strength of the trees, may the spirit of God be with us in our communion as we go forth to be your hands and feet. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day and a great week, and we'll see you next week.